a very bad disease. Um, it's common. We've estimated that in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's probably somewhere between 100,000 to 250,000 uh, new infants <clears throat> under a year of age developing hydrocephalus per year. We don't have good numbers. These are based on coming at it from different uh, angles, but there, there's a lot. So there's a big burden of disease. Um, and the good news is it's a treatable disease. Um, the way this is treated has been treated historically uh, for the last 50 years is to play something called a shunt. A shunt is a tube that goes from the fluid space in the brain down to the abdominal cavity, which is sort of like a barrel that has all the other uh, organs in it. Some of our barrels are bigger than others. And, um, but there, that's a fluid, that's a cavity that's able to absorb fluid. And so this idea, uh, this technology came about in the late 1950s and it's virtually been unchanged for the last 50 years. And it works, but the problem is it creates dependence on this implanted device which is, uh, of all medical implanted devices, this one has the highest failure rate. And uh, billions of dollars have gone into trying to make a better one, and they've never been able to make a better one. So what's wrong with the shunt? The, the problem is it has to be maintained, because about half of them will have failed uh, in the first couple of years. And over the lifetime of a child, one can expect at least two to three, on average, uh, shunt failures that require an operation, and these are usually emergencies, and when a child is dependent on a shunt, if they can't get quickly to emergency care, uh, they can die from a shunt malfunction. <clears throat> now, in the U.S., we're able to, to do this. We maintain these kids' shunts. They come to the emergency room. We fix them in the middle of the night. Uh, it's typically an emergency. Uh, in the United States, we spend $2 billion a year of healthcare dollars maintaining shunts. So it's a, it's a big burden financially, it's a burden on families, and that's not even counting the false alarms. A kid with a shunt has a headache and vomiting, the parents go to the emergency room, it could be a shunt malfunction, it turns out to be the flu. Well, they've had an emergency room, people are afraid to travel, they're tied to this thing, they're always worried about the shunt. Is going to fail. And then there are those bad cases that can have scores of operations. Uh, I inherited a, a patient when I first came back to the States who was 16 and she had 200 shunt operations uh, by then. So it's, it's really, it's, it's, it, we can manage this in North America, but everybody recognizes that it's not a good treatment. It's a, it's a treatment that's expected to fail and needs to be maintained. <clears throat> the problem is when you go to Africa, when you start putting these things in, you know you're putting in a device in a child that's going to work immediately, and it may work for months, it may work for a few years, but the chances are uh, 80, 90 percent that in the first 10 years that's going to fail at least once, and if the child is out in northern Uganda, <coughs> southern Sudan, eastern Congo, and you put a shunt in them in Mbali, they're not going to get back to you for shunt malfunction. So you know you're creating a situation that most likely is gonna to lead to a disaster for that child. Yeah. How, how, I've always wondered how fast, when one stops functioning, how long does it take? Depends on the age. So for a baby, uh, babies can tolerate some hydrocephalus because they have a soft head. So the head starts to grow again, fontanel gets full, baby gets fussy, maybe starts to vomit. Mom has some time to travel. Once the child gets much past two years of age, um, and the, the skull is fused and the brain is not so compliant, uh, they can't accommodate that with increasing volume. So the pressure rises quickly and uh, they can die within 24 hours. Yeah. So not all of them do and there are varying degrees of shunt dependence and I'm not gonna get into the compli you know, sort of that complicated discussion, but suffice it to say it can be, a, it's a life-threatening emergency when a shunt fails. So what we did in Uganda was, and I'm not going to go through much of this at all, but for some historical and uh, physiological reasons, we developed <clears throat> a way to treat this without a shunt. We took an idea that was currently being used, had been since the 19, late, late 90s. This wasn't being done when I was a fellow, but in the late 90s. Uh, 
people started to look at doing an ETV, which stands for endoscopic with an endoscope, third ventricle ostomy, third ventricle ostomy. It means making a hole in the floor of the brain and let the fluid out. And um, that was being starting to be done, and it was mostly indicated for older patients, older kids, adults, with a, a particular type of hydrocephalus, and it had, a, it had a good success rate. But people's experiences with doing this in babies had been very slim, and what experience there had been had been not successful. It, it didn't, didn't work in babies very, very often. <coughs> um, most of our clientele were babies. So we started doing ETV, found as similar to other people that this was successful in about 40% or so overall, um, depending on the, the cause of hydrocephalus, actually closer to 35% or so. And then um, we added a second part to that procedure that we call CPC, which stands for choroid plexus cauterization. There's some tissue in the brain called choroid plexus. It makes some of the fluid. It pulsates and sends pressure waves into the ventricles. And if you reduce that tissue by cauterizing it, we found that it increases dramatically the success rate of the ETV. So the combined procedure, for instance, children with spina bifida that have hydrocephalus, it increased their success rate from 35% to 76%. And overall, um, we can count on this procedure working first time, no other surgeries needed, in about 60%. A little bit more than that, closer to, close to two thirds. So success meaning no further operations. Now you can revise an ETV that closes early and still avoid a shunt long term, but we're talking about one time only operation. A key thing to understand about this is the, um, the failure pattern. Never mind. I'll do, I'll do you one more. It's no problem. Um, if you look at shunts, if you put in 100 shunts, in six months, a certain number of them will have failed. In two years, about half of them will have failed, but the curve continues on down. So that over the course of time, almost everybody's going to have at least one shunt failure, and most people, multiple shunt failures. If you look at, so this is shunt, VP shunt, ventricular peritoneal shunt. If you look at ETV CPC, yes, they're failures, but they almost all occur by six months. So they're doing this, and then they flatten out, and they do that. So in this six month period of time, you will have identified most failures it occurs in babies during a safe period of time when the head can grow and mom has time to get back. Uh, it's, a, it's a window of time that you can be especially vigilant and follow up on the babies. And once they get to the six month mark, it becomes really unusual for them to fail. There are a few late failures, but they're unusual. So <clears throat> this is a, a, a key uh, window of time. Um, in, in 2000, 